Are all animal lovers vegan? Why or why not? No, they're not. Uh, there's a lot of people that consider themselves animal lovers and they're not. And I think it's what you've talked about before in this podcast. Maybe it's that cognitive dissonance or uh, what I've mentioned before is just that kind of prevalent ideology in our society. We view certain animals in a different way. Greetings, I'm Steve Gavrilos, Canada's plant-based pharmacist and your host for today's podcast called Planting the Seed. It's sponsored by Easttown Pharmacy and the Plant-Based Wellness Forum. The goal today is to plant a seed in your mind and in your heart about a subject that is a very sensitive and important one, but also a very controversial one. It's called veganism. Controversial because veganism challenges our understanding, our morals, our ethics, and our beliefs about the foods that we eat as part of our traditional and everyday diets, many of which incorporate a lot of animal products. I'm very excited to have this conversation about veganism with a gentleman called Michael McDowell from Windsor, Ontario. Michael became a vegan six years ago as a result of a very heartwarming and enlightening story that he's going to share with us today and how this lifestyle change into veganism has become a passion and mission for Michael to spread the message about health and compassion. So stay tuned for a great conversation. Mike, how are you doing? Good, Steve. How are you? Good, good. It's great to have you on the set here. I was really looking forward to you coming today. Yeah, thanks for uh, giving me an invitation. So I understand you're a vegan. Yes. Uh, you know what? We're going to have a great conversation today about not only veganism, but also health uh, and compassion. They all go together hand in hand. Uh, but, you know, we just met briefly on the way here. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm 36 years old. I was uh, born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, and I currently work at a factory. Well, because I worked at a factory, which one is it? <laughs> Chrysler. <laughs> Chrysler. You know what? That's something to be proud of, man. You know, working at Chrysler gives you a job, gives you an opportunity. Uh, and uh, I used to work there when I was a TPT back in the day. As a matter of fact, I remember working there when they changed over uh, prior to Chrysler's almost uh, going into bankruptcy. They changed over into the minivan. So I was there that summer uh, helping out. And uh, it was an exciting time. And uh, how many how many uh, workers, how many employees are at Chrysler's right now? Plan oh, three. I'm not sure right now. I Maybe over 3,000? 3, 3,000. Yeah. And, and then that, that trickles into other employment around the city as well. Right. Um, and so what are they making now? Are they making the Pacifica still? Or? Uh, Pacifica, and they do have a version of the Grand Caravan, which is based on the Pacifica model. I see. And which department do you work in? Uh, I work in trim. So in I'm an auto, auto assembler and trim, yeah. Man, you, you and I have a lot of things in common. <laughs> First of all, I understand you became a vegan six years ago, correct? Yes, around then. Yeah, and, and so did I. And secondly, you know, we both worked at Chrysler's. And thirdly, when I was a um, TPT there, I worked in trim. <laughs> I, was, I was also a TPT. Yeah. yeah. So it was a good time. Um, you know, I remember one thing about uh, Chrysler's, the cafeteria. Uh, I don't know if the food uh, was, was uh, still terrible, but it was nothing really good back then. How, how's the food in, in the cafeteria? Uh, the cafeteria is super small now. I don't even know if you can call it that. It's more of a grab and go, and they have oh, okay. they have uh, uh, a few people working there making uh, some items. But other than uh, grabbing a couple Cliff Bars or a few other uh, might be a few other options. There's not that many options oh, okay. for so, for uh, plant based eaters. So more for, for more or less, any everybody brings their own lunch then, right? With, so you guys still have the lunch pail and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, with 3,000 employees there, um, how do you, how do you uh, look at the, their health? You know, you ever say, hey, you know, these guys are healthy, not healthy. Like, how do you see the, the guys working in there? Um, do you have I any think, health issues? Uh, I can see it. And I, I like, especially when people order out and, uh, you know, they're ordering, uh, they're not eating plant-based. There's, there's a few people and I have also a, affected some change in in my area with some people mm -hmm. um some people take care of their health more some people don't um 
you know, there's a lot of fast food, especially right across the street. People can go and grab something. Yeah, um, for sure. McDonald's, Burger King, Harvey's. Yeah, and some of them have an option for plant-based eaters. That's true. That yeah. is very true. They've actually accommodated some plant-based eaters, which is which is kind of nice. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, I'm focusing a little bit, a lot, a lot on these uh, Chrysler employees because I find <laughs> it very fascinating. Uh, because you know, in general, uh, we here in Canada and in, in, in the states and the UK and Australia, as as four examples, most of us follow the North American or standard American diet, which is called, you know, the SAD diet. And uh, the standard American diet is loaded with saturated fats from animal products particularly. It's loaded with processed foods. It's loaded with, um, you know, a lot of fast foods and ultra processed foods like Burger King, McDonald's, and um, a lot of sugar, salt, and oil. And so about 60% of the population here in Canada and also in the United States are actually in the overweight or obese categories. And, and this, this problem, this chronic problem, uh, leads to all these chronic diseases that we, we see today. And that's why I asked you what kind of, you know, what type of health the, uh, the, the guys are. And I have, I have a pretty good idea. Like young guys like yourself, you know, I'm sure you take care of yourself and you, you know, you're plant-based vegan. Other guys also try to find a certain, follow a certain type of diet and exercise. Uh, is there a lot of elderly guys that are ready to retire or more of a young group of employees there at Chrysler's? Uh, like I said, it's kind of like, a, it's a mix. And, it's a mix. And maybe there's more young coming in, but uh, I don't know everyone's situation, whether they want to retire or not. Right. Well, I mean, th this here, Mike, is it Mike or Michael? What do you prefer? That uh, I, I go by Michael usually, like but Michael. it's okay. You like the official. Oh, I'm going to call yeah. you Michael. I like Michael. <laughs> Very nice name. Actually, I think it's the number one boy's name for new babies, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know anymore. Is that, I, I that, think so. I think I was reading something. But, um, you know, this is a great opportunity for you, Michael, uh, to uh, spread the message in, in Chrysler's because, you know, uh, talking about being an activist and, you know, we haven't gotten to that point of how much of an activist you are, whether you are or not. The point is, activism isn't always just staying on a street corner or going on a YouTube video or something, but it's actually affecting the people around you, your family and friends. And I think it's a great opportunity, not only for your family and friends, but for all the people at Chrysler's that, uh, work there for you guys that all work there and you're bringing your lunch with your processed meats and, and a pop and all that stuff I think it's a great opportunity for you guys to watch this video uh, We hope to get a lot of great uh, information out for you to help you live a longer healthier and more happy life So I think that's one of the goals we want to accomplish today if we can So that's pretty well about the, uh, the standard American diet is that it's very uh, it's very common 60% of the people um, in, in, in uh, Canada and the U.S. are either overweight or obese, which is the foundation, like I said, for all these chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, common forms of cancer, autoimmune diseases. These, whether people realize it or not, actually comes from the food that we eat. Well, and if you also look at the new Canadian food guide, it actually <laughs> backs plant-based eating. I don't know if someone did it as a joke there, but they uh, taped it to my locker at one point, <laughs> and I turned it around and highlighted how it points out to start eating more plant-based foods, and they actually took out dairy. The only thing with um, food guides, like whatever they have in the States or the Canadian food guide, is the adherence. Most people don't follow the actual guide. And uh, are we actually like looking at it and making those changes? You're or, absolutely or no? right. That, that's fantastic you brought up. That was uh, published in uh, 2019, in January. I remember that very well, because I highlighted that to a lot of my clients and patients exactly what you said, that it took off dairy as one of the groups. Uh, and actually, it, it, it's a plant-forward food guide. It promoted plant proteins in lieu of animal, product, and animal proteins, which is huge. Well, and with um, rising inflation, it's actually cheaper for us to buy lentils and cook lentils than uh, any type of flesh at the supermarket. You're absolutely right. I, I read a survey that says it's about 30% cheaper when you when you uh, buy plants instead of animal products. I mean, the, the price of animal flesh, animal meat has gone up significantly, especially during the, the, the pandemic, I think. I mean, everything's gone up, but the price of, uh, you know, animals has gone up tremendously. You know, that's great that we're on the same page. I mean, like I said, I think we have a lot of things in common. Um, the other thing that I want to ask you about uh, besides the standard American diet, is you mentioned plant-based and you're a plant-based eater, and, and so am I. And so I've been doing uh, whole food, plant-based, as much as possible whole food, uh, from 2017. Uh, actually, I became uh, plant-based, I'll call it vegan, on May 20th, 2017. So it's going to be six years uh, 
for me next month. When did you, when did you, uh, do you remember the day you actually said no more animal products? Um, it was three months after I brought a dog home into my life. Uh, it was in August. I think it was around August 16th. Okay. So that's like kind of my date, but uh, I'm sure we'll get into yeah, yeah, we will. talking yeah. about it yeah. more. But I, I was definitely eating plant-based and learning about veganism. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the beautiful thing about plant-based is, you know, when you do something for your health, like I did it for my health, I had some ischemic heart disease and uh, the doctors wanted me to go and do the traditional medical procedures, angiogram, you know, possible stent, all that stuff. But instead, I, I uh, discovered Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn mm -hmm. from the Cleveland Clinic and his famous uh, book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He appears in the movie, along with other physicians, uh, in the movie called Forks Over Knives. You've probably seen that, right? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there they talk about eating whole food plant-based, which is simply uh, the food that grows out of the ground. Like you, you mentioned lentils, but there's lentils, there's fruits, there's vegetables, there's complex starches. People hear the word starch, they, they kind of panic. No, we're talking about complex starches, not processed, and also whole grains with a little bit of nuts and seeds. So that's whole food plant-based diet, right? Yeah, and it might not be uh, considered plant-based because it's a fungus, but but fungi, uh, you can also include that in. Oh, the, the mushrooms, you mean? Mushrooms. Oh, yes. mushrooms are so healthy. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, they, they don't, don't they call those plants? What do they call those? Just they just classify them as fungi? Uh, yeah, I believe so. But yeah. uh, like, yeah. I, I would say like it can be in, uh, it's under the plant kingdom, even though it's mm. considered a fungus. Right, right. A absolutely. It grows in the ground, you know. So uh, the way I tell people is, you know, you want to follow a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, you just eat the food that God made, you know, because all these things grow on the ground, whether they grow on the ground or grow on a tree, you know, that's where they come from. So, but the problem is, I think one problem that I really want to touch on today uh, is plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet versus a vegan diet. Because vegan, uh, we'll talk about veganism more, but a vegan diet is a diet without animal products. But from your perspective and your knowledge, what do you think is the difference between eating a whole food plant-based diet and eating a diet that's vegan, that's without animal products? Aren't they the same thing? Well, like you were saying, uh, plant-based diet is like fruits, nuts, seeds, berries, legumes, um, whole grains, stuff that comes from the ground. You could include maybe some oil. Um, we could do dairy alternatives, perhaps faux meats. I know that's getting away from whole foods. Um, and in my opinion, there's no such thing as an actual vegan diet. I know plenty of vegans. I have no idea what they're eating. Usually diets, like before I came to veganism, I was paleo for five years. I followed a strict diet set of rules. Whole food plant-based, if you're strict, is what it is. It's whole food plant-based. Mm. But vegan, we can be whole food plant-based. We can be a junk food vegan. We could be we could be eating anything as long as it's not derived from an animal. So I even know some plant-based people that still include honey, but I, the way I word it is it's still derived from an animal. It's not vegan. It's not even a plant-based. Mm. It's coming from an animal. And there's a whole other topic of discussion when we discuss honey. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have time to talk about it, but yes. you're right. That's also one of the things that vegans avoid. But you, you hit the nail on the head is that a vegan diet, <clears throat> the terms are used interchangeably. Oh, I think we focus on food too much. Like when we hear the word vegan, um, I believe that people think automatically food instead of the whole rest of it. Exactly, exactly. And we'll, we'll talk about it. I, think I put that under veganism, but the, there's a lot of terminology when you go into a restaurant and you tell, like, when I go into a restaurant, I say, I want to eat something plant-based. Like, they don't really understand. So I go, I want something vegan. Then they get it. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a talk, a pharmacy talk last week, and I talked to the owner of Coma, K-O-M-A, uh, Kitchen of Michael Anthony. Very great, great food. And uh, when I told him, he goes, okay, well, well, we'll call you Vegan Steve so that we know that it's for you, right? Because there's other, other pharmacists that are just eating traditional. But what I want to uh, bring out to people listening is, number one, it shouldn't be called a vegan diet. You're right. But it is used interchangeably. Even uh, plant-based physicians use it, like uh, Dr. Garth Davis, mm -hmm. author of uh, Proteinaholic, um, you know, uh, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Clapper. I think they use that term interchangeably with whole food plant-based diet. But the guy who really highlights it and doesn't like to hear that, do you know who that is? I believe so. Is it? Uh, I can't think of his name. Dr. Uh, T. Colin Campbell. Yes, uh, yeah, who wrote the China study. Exactly. Yes. So you, you knew who it was. So Dr. T. Colin Campbell 
definitely doesn't want to use the terms interchangeably and rightfully slow. So because a vegan diet, as you mentioned correctly, can be a healthy vegan diet if it's whole foods, but it can be very unhealthy when it's processed. So, uh, for example, chips, Coke, uh, Doritos, those are all vegan. They don't come from animal products. But yet if you, you know, uh, had a diet of those kind of things, you're going to get sick very quickly. And I believe that also, too, if we want to eat more whole foods, we can. Like where I'm coming from is more like you can indulge every once in a while is okay. I think I went too much into that indulgent phase. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I went from not eating any processed foods for five years to then uh, I w- did originally switch for health reasons, but then I slowly stopped taking care of myself and mm-hmm. started doing more processed foods, more uh, vegan junk food, if you want to call it that. Um, but I think it's okay to still have that every once in a while. And, you know, whether it's you want to call it treating yourself or whether you follow an 80 20 principle or whatever you want to do, but it's just not being so hard on ourselves and being more kind to ourselves and allowing us to have, like, hey, you know what? There's a company that makes a a vegan cinnamon bun, I can have that every once in a while. It might be a nice treat, but every day, maybe not. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, we don't want to, you know, uh, put ourselves in jail and say, you know, you can never touch, like you say, a vegan, uh, you know, cinnamon or something like that. But I think the closer you adhere to a whole food plant-based diet, uh, the better. Uh, even all the longest lived uh, cultures in the world, the blue zones, places like that, they don't. They may not necessarily go 100%, but they're up to like 95%. Even the Kenyan runners, the marathon runners, you know, they're up to about 95% plant-based. But you mentioned that you went, uh, you did it for health reasons first. Do you, do you mind if we talk about that? Like, why, why did you go into that? For what was the health issue? I don't know if there was any health issue. It was, and I know, like, if you want to talk about this now, I know we're going to get into it. But um, it was from who I met and what I was into at the time. I was mm-hmm. working out like six, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. I was in the army for eight years. Oh. Uh, and I was eating a, a paleolithic diet for um, five years in that time. And uh, who I met who sparked my interest mm-hmm. kind of read what I cared about and approached it from instead of animal rights or instead of an environment, which I care about both. Um he knew at the time I cared about my health mm-hmm. and kind of sparked my interest. And I watched what the health mm-hmm. and that kind of shocked me and went, what am, what am I putting in my body? Right. Uh, so then I went completely a hundred percent plant-based the next day. And then after that, I watched another documentary about the environment and started kind of going down that path. But I think I was more open to learning about everything because I was fully Mm -hmm. plant-based and I think there's a lot behind that where we're maybe not as receptive if you know we're sharing a meal with someone and having this conversation Mm -hmm. perhaps it's best shared over a plant-based meal than an animal derived meal because then the defenses will already be up people don't want to hear that something that they're doing might be bad or right 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 uh, okay so that makes sense you 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 did it for health reasons just to prevent any health issues from coming up and based on your research you found that a plant-based diet is probably the best thing to help you prevent those health issues well and at the beginning i i uh really felt like inflammation went down and i felt great and i was like oh wow but i did have health issues within the last few years as a vegan but i didn't blame it on the diet at all i think it has a lot to do with like my self-care routine and and i was really stressed out i think with the pandemic but also uh mm-hmm. maybe focusing a little bit too much on animal rights and what's going on with the environment mm-hmm. and um right i get it not taking care of myself so like stress can also be very detrimental to our bodies absolutely it's one, it's one of the pillars of health i mean diet is one thing uh, you know, lifestyle medicine, that's what lifestyle medicine is about. It's not just diet. It's, it's also stress relaxation. It's also avoiding toxic substances, you know, alcohol, drugs, all those things together, uh, you know, gives you your ultimate health. So when, when you're, you're, off of ba- you're off balance and you're, let's say you're focusing on plant-based nutrition and especially if you're having some vegan junk food along the way and then you're having all that stress, you're not sleeping enough and especially with the pandemic, I mean, who wasn't under stress, you know, for those two and a half years uh, you know, it's going to affect you. So definitely it's just a matter of you, uh, you know, uh, regaining that balance again, you know, so. And I'm definitely on the way. <laughs> that, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, you're a very knowledgeable person and, um, you know, learning about these things on your own, 
Uh, like I, I learned a lot about these things. I've been studying this also for the last six years. Um, I did take a, a course in plant-based nutrition through the Dr. T. Campbell uh, nutrition uh, program. And I also took another course through Dr. Pam Popper diet and lifestyle intervention. But, you know, th that was a good starting point. But, I mean, you can never learn uh, that much until you really watch the documentaries and read the books and listen to the audibles. And it's just amazing how this world of knowledge just opens up, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, so we talked about uh, vegan junk food, uh, which we all want to avoid. Uh, we, wanna, we talked about this between plant-based diet and vegan diet. We don't want to use them interchangeably. We want to differentiate between the two because vegan, as you said, has a lot bigger meaning. So the next question is, what is veganism? And what uh, does it mean to be a vegan? All right, so uh, veganism is a social and political movement in opposition to the intentional exploitation, commodification, and oppression of animals, whether that's for food, clothing, vivisection, and animal testing, entertainment, or any other purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so what it means to be a vegan is that we're not using animals in that way. Um, so that's why I kind of say that it's not a diet. It's more of a philosophy. You're absolutely right. You're, sorry to cut you off. But no, that's okay. You're absolutely right. It's not a diet. And it, it is a philosophy. And the way I look at it, too, it's also... Um, aligning your your uh, actions with your values because you know to be honest if you ask anybody do you believe in animal cruelty what, what do they usually say i think most people <laughs> uh don't agree with it they yeah. don't yeah unless they're like a completely evil person you know they're they're, they're never going to say i believe in animal cruelty so if you don't believe in animal cruelty to begin with are you are you why are you so disconnected from what you're doing by supporting the animal uh, the, the meat industry, right? That's, a, that's an issue. I think we're confined to a particular ideology um, where it's normalized violence in our society. We think it's necessary uh, and we don't view it as use is the cruelty or use is the abuse. Uh, and we think that we need to wear them or to <laughs> eat them or to, to them. use them for entertainment. You know, my, my daughter uh, made, a, made a good description of it, and she, she said, veganism is the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. So we're, when you're in a, you know, in a room with people, I mean, we all know what we're doing. We're eating uh, animal flesh, animal, you know, animal flesh. Uh, and nobody wants to talk about it. And she called it, it's not, when you don't acknowledge veganism, it's like an ostrich effect. You know, when the ostrich sticks its head in the ground, says, I don't want to know what's going on up there. Well, I think that that's a very good uh, description. Uh, my daughter, her name is Alexa. And uh, she's also a, a vegan as well. Like myself, my wife, and my daughter became, they, came, they became shortly after me. At the beginning, they were like, eh, we're going to go keto. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. But then once they realized, you know, the facts, and also once you actually tune in to your, to your soul and, and what's, you know, your sense of right and wrong, there's no other answer but, you know, veganism. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a term called cognitive dissonance. Have you ever heard of that term? Yes, I have. Oh, that's good. What, what's, what does it mean to you? Um, I probably have a hard time um, actually explaining what cognitive dissonance is, uh, so I don't know if I'm the best on the topic. I kind, of, I kind of mentioned it before, and actually I just I looked up on Google to find a, a, you know, a good definition. I think this is a great definition. Cognitive dissonance is a mental conflict that occurs when your beliefs don't line up with your actions. I kind of mentioned that before. It's an uncomfortable state of mind when someone has contradictory values, attitudes, and perspectives about the same thing. So it could be why we tend to ignore it in our society or why people don't want to hear it, right? Like we have that particular ideology. Yeah. We don't want to hear about other ideologies because this one is so prevalent in our society. And then, yeah, that's where the cognitive dissonance comes into play, where a lot of us or most of us don't agree with animal cruelty, but we're not willing to look into how our actions are affecting others and the planet. Yeah, how um, our dissonance is actually affecting them. Here's an example of uh, cognitive dissonance is smoking. Smoking, we know that if you, everybody knows that if you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer more, more than likely and die sooner than you normally would. Uh, people know that if you eat processed meats, they're a class one carcinogen, same as smoking, but yet they continue to eat processed meats because they're in sandwiches and subs and all that stuff. And those are increase the likelihood of colon cancer significantly, right? Which is one of the main leading causes of cancer. Uh, cognitive disson dissonance, you mentioned it's uh, ideology. I also look at it as, you know, 
uh, tradition. So we have traditions, right? We have Thanksgiving, we have Christmas, we have Easter, we have whatever, birthdays, all that stuff. And those are always celebrated with dead animal flesh, with a dead animal, right? Especially in the Greek culture, uh, I hate to say it, I hate to admit it, and I used to participate in this thing. You know, they'll, they'll take like the whole lamb and they'll put it on the spit. You know, everybody gets a kick out of it. But you know what? Like when you actually connect with what you're doing, that animal, that animal didn't ask to be killed and put on a spit. That animal was born to have a life, just like every other, every other human being and every other animal that God places on the earth. We, we should have the right to live our life, you know, normally, right? So that's, that's where I think uh, the traditions really affect uh, the, this cognitive dis dissonance. And, you know, with traditions, I think we can change traditions. They take, they take a long time. Uh, like back in uh, the Old Testament days, uh, they sacrificed children, right? They don't do that anymore, thank goodness. They sacrificed uh, women. They sacrificed animals, you know, to, to cleanse their sins. Uh, not so recently, I mean, more recently, we, we hear of uh, genital mutilation. That's a tradition in some cultures. Like, like, we know that that's wrong, right? So I think it's a matter of uh, people like yourself and myself and all these other great uh, activists. I mean, you know, we're just two guys here. But uh, some of these, you know, super activists that we're going to talk about in a bit are doing a tremendous job of, of getting the word out, you know, and getting people to connect with their true feelings. Yeah, and, and uh, we can't just use the justification of something as a tradition. Uh, we have to evaluate those things, discern for ourselves, and uh, that takes us looking actually like looking into ourselves mm -hmm. and how we mm -hmm. feel about these things yeah. instead of just uh, kind of like I said, that ideology that's been maybe unknowingly put on us since we were born. Like, you know, we just following in the footsteps of a lot of times of what our parents did. And it's no fault of theirs. Like no. a lot of us didn't know this. Um, like you were talking about your different traditions. Like my family used to have a pig roast every year. Uh, if they yeah, still exactly. do, I don't go, but... Um, that's something that we did every year. And I even have pictures in front of the pig with a thumbs up. Uh, but that's an individual right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it took me a while to make that connection. I just think, first of all, as an aside, we're having a great conversation. I love all this information that's coming out, you know, and, and I want to thank you. If I didn't thank you at the beginning for coming, I want to thank you now uh, for, for participating in, in this podcast. Um, I want to say, I got a definition here of veganism. And I want you to give me your best definition, and I'm going to give you mine before we go on to the next question. What's your, what's your definition of veganism? So the definition I gave you prior was from uh, EA. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name correctly. Um, that's what I, I kind of agree with hers. It's, it's different from the vegan societies where it is a social and political movement. I do believe that uh, veganism is that. And it's uh, against the use of animals, whether it's for entertainment or food and yeah. i think a lot of times when we hear veganism like i said we focus on food too much yeah no no you, you that, that is a great definition i agree with you and there was one word you, you used in that definition the first time you said it and i didn't understand maybe oppression or no there was another word in there vivisection yeah yeah what's that mean i've never heard that word before um so vivisection is when we like cut an animals open in animal ah. testing so a lot of times i'll just say animal testing yeah um but like we still test on dogs in Canada and among any, many other animals, but it's when we usually do something to them and then we're cutting them open. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, that makes sense. They use it in um, pharmaceutical research and medical research, right, all that kind of stuff. And there's a very good, um, I forget the exact name for it, it's the Canadian Center for uh, Alternatives to Animal Methods, Right. actually at the University of Windsor, and mm -hmm. it was the first one in all of Canada. They, they do it here in Windsor too? They Well, they do have animal testing here in Windsor, okay. but this is, the opposite of animal testing. Oh, what is that? They're using new technologies. You Instead can, of, in lieu of animals. In lieu of animals, okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, that's nice. And it's here in Windsor, Ontario. Okay, well, that's amazing. good to know. That's good to know. Maybe another guest for your podcast. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, veganism, to me, it's an ethical and moral belief that all living beings are sentient. We didn't talk about the word sentient. And have a right to live and not to be exploited in any way. So it's kind of like what you're saying. And it's living in alignment with your core values and your ethical and moral beliefs. What, what is sentience? Uh, sentience is a kind of like consciousness. Like mm -hmm. all these animals have their own individuality. Exactly. Um, and 
they're just as aware that they're here and have families. We're so similar to them uh, in the ways that matter the most. You're, so the majority of animals are just trying to survive, eat, have families. And if you watch nature documentaries, you can actually see that. Or if you go outside and spend time in nature and see them and not just look at the mundane activities they're doing, mm -hmm. you can actually see personalities. If you ever live with a cat or a dog or another companion, I think that's when you start seeing that they are all different. They all have personalities. They all have wants, needs, desires. If you visit an animal sanctuary and see animals rescued from these industries, and you can also see them come out of their shell and act differently and notice that one cow is different from another cow. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and they're not just, you know, there for whatever purpose we've decided for them. Exactly. That, that's a great definition of sentience. They, like you said, they know that they're alive. They're conscious. They know that they're alive. You explain that they have families and, you know, they have feelings, they have personalities. They're, they are persons. They're just not human persons. Yeah, and we've taken away their personhood. <clears throat> and I really like... Uh, the terminology that you're using. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, so the thing with them being sentient is they know that they're alive. Whereas we humans, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have consciousness, but we're also self-conscious. Mm -hmm. Because I, I never realized this until I, I, had a, I got a dog. I think it's around the same time you did too. I never had a dog before. I had a dog a long time ago, but I didn't have, it wasn't like a house dog. So anyways, six years ago, we bought this golden doodle. Her name is Lyra, L-Y-R-A, Lyra. I never realized that when dogs look in the mirror, they don't recognize themselves. Did you know that? Obviously, you know that, right? I think so. I think some animals can and some animals think fail, so? fail that test. Okay, but, but dogs specifically. Yes. So when I, when I saw it, I'm like, wow. You know, so I looked into it more and I said, okay, so these dogs, obviously, they know they're alive. They come, you know, they want to be petted, fed, hugged, all that stuff, you know, taken for a walk. But they don't realize they're themselves as being in this world. <clears throat> like they do, they do, but they don't recognize their, their image, let's say. And so the difference between that and a human being is we know uh, that we're self-conscious. We know that we're, we're, we're also alive. But the difference is that uh, the dogs always live in the moment, or the animals, sorry, not just dogs, but animals live in the moment. They actually, you know, live in the, in the now. Which and that might be a beautiful thing to, to be present. Imagine how many, that, like how that would benefit humans to be more present. Exactly. That would avoid all stresses, all worries, <laughs> yeah. you know, worrying about the past, worrying about the future. And the other thing about animals is they don't, they don't know that they're going to die. So they live their life to the fullest. Whereas we uh, get all this anxiety, you know, for future events that are not, you know, not, not happening right, right now. And um, so I think that, yeah, animals enjoy, you know, they should be given the right to enjoy their life to the fullest. Before we go on to the next topic, you know, I wanted to bring up something you mentioned before. You said that, you know, you don't always have to be 100%. Uh, for example, you talked about the Cinnabon and all that stuff. And I agree with you, like for myself. So I don't even know if I should consider myself a vegan. I kind of do. I'm kind of like a borderline vegan because I am whole food plant-based since the last six years. And... Uh, I, I totally 100% believe in, in veganism. I support it 100%. And that's the reason why I asked you to come on, on today's podcast, uh, Planting a Seed. Uh, so, but, you know, there has been some times um, where, you know, I might eat a little bit of cheese and a spinach pie. I don't go buying it. Uh, there has been, you know, a couple of times there might be a little bit of cheese on the pizza, which I don't eat very often. So I don't go out there and actually buy the dairy or buy the eggs. And if I had to guess how many times... There's probably been maybe 10 times in the last six years, right? But when I'm eating that, I'm actually very conscious of where it's coming from, right? So I know where, that, where, where the cheese is coming from, where the dairy is coming from. So, uh, and I think what's important is that, you know, people don't need to just jump 100%. Like you said before, if you, even if you did 80-20, right? Well, when I said that, I meant like 80 20 like whole foods plant-based to 20 percent like processed vegan oh, okay, okay. junk not necessarily mm -hmm. uh veganism because like i've never stepped out of it besides there's been some mistakes but mm -hmm. if i if i knowingly know that there's dairy or something in it i won't touch it so if someone were to give me pizza and i knew that it, it wasn't a vegan pizza mm -hmm. i'm just gonna decline i just rather not eat it's okay i can go that meal or i can find something else that's vegan mm -hmm. to eat and so that's kind of how I'll, like I, I do believe in total animal liberation, so I, I would like to get there, and I don't mm. believe I'll get there for with, because uh, it's their movement. I think a lot of times people, 
like we need to realize that veganism is about the animals themselves, right? And mm-hmm. it's it's technically their movement, but they're screaming, but we're just not listening to them. So as advocates for animals, like we're doing the talking, they're not represented in uh, politics. Uh, so it would be great to have that representation uh, too. So, uh, but yeah, we don't need to like be upset at other people for like, I think maybe for a while I was upset at other people if they step off it or, or anything, but yeah, everyone's on their own journey. And I think that uh, they need to come to these connections and realizations themselves. And like maybe after this conversation, maybe you don't do that and, and mm-hmm. you think like, hey, uh, but yeah. but yeah, when I mentioned 80-20, I meant more like okay. from whole foods to processed vegan food, but staying within veganism. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. So, but what I, what I believe is perfect is the enemy of good. And I hear this from a physician that I listen to on a weekly uh, podcast. If we're going to get uh, the world to realize that 80 billion farm animals are being slaughtered every year, one to three trillion fish are being slaughtered every year. <clears throat> you know, you need to make a significant change. <clears throat> and to, to get that significant change, you can't. It's not like turning the light switch on and on, on and off. I think my just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know there has to be a dimmer on there where you know you're 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 opening up the dimmer from the dark room where you can't see anything, any any uh, exploitation, any cruelty, and you have to gradually do that for some people. Like for me, I switched 100% to uh, plant-based to, uh, 2017. But along the way, as I read these uh, health books, and I, I, I'll just call in mind Dr. Walter Longo, who talks about the book uh, Fasting, Mimic, and Diet. He talks about just from the health perspective. He believes in you know avoiding animal products, but he talks about from the health perspective and based on longevity. He says you know people over a certain age, like 65, they need more you know more dairy and more eggs. He doesn't talk about it. He says, you can do a completely vegan diet if you want. So I thought about that. I said, well, you know, maybe there is elderly people that are in their 80s or something that do need some dairy and do, do need some eggs. So I, the way I look at it is this, is I don't believe in any sort of exploitation. So chaining cows or, you know, uh, chickens or whatever to produce uh, milk and eggs respectively, I think is wrong. But if you have a, that good old McDonald's farm and you're able to get some dairy from the cow that's not exploiting the cow in any way, small amount, like that's not realistically possible every day. But, you know, if there's a possibility, you can go out in the county and maybe get some dairy from uh, a local farmer or get some eggs that, where the animal hasn't been exploited. What do you think of that? Uh, well, I think that use is abuse. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter about welfareism or how the animal is actually treated. Is We're using them as a commodity for what we, we think they're designed for. Mm-hmm. Uh, for that cow, that cow's a mother. She has to give birth. And like a human mammal, uh, as we are also animals, um, they're similar to us in that they are an animal that has a nine-month pregnancy term. Mm-hmm. That baby is then taken away from her. So regardless of how they're treated, the baby's still taken away because we're going, that cheese, that ice cream, that whey protein powder, that dairy uh, is for us or you know when we could have something else. So when it comes to someone that might, you said as you said, need the dairy or eggs, um, perhaps that we can find a nutrients in the plant kingdom to give them, mm-hmm. but we would have to have the system change in place and provide those products for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to eggs, I go down to the root cause. So like some people will be like, what about backyard eggs and chickens? And you know, they're treated well in my backyard and mm-hmm. I don't exploit them. We're ignoring the violent history of oppression that began by taking a jungle fowl, this bird out of the jungle and making it produce 300 eggs per year Mm -hmm. in the wild they only lay about 12 to 15 eggs Mm -hmm. solely for reproduction Mm -hmm. but they're not producing eggs every day for us to take so we've taken them out of the wild and changed them a dairy cow is not natural to what uh whatever a cattle would be in the wild we've taken them out of that we've you know genetically changed them over the years to produce so much and like i said at the end of the day they're a mother Sometimes I've used this example and maybe people don't, aren't hearing me or maybe it's lost and I got to stop mm-hmm. using it. But imagine I took like a blue jay or a cardinal mm-hmm. and I kept it in my backyard and then made it produce eggs year after year and started producing more. 
people would probably go like, what are you nuts? What are you doing to that cardinal? But when we do it to a chicken, it somehow makes it okay. So that's kind of my stance on it. I don't think if we have these conversations and if we're not like calm, like we're not going to get anywhere from me being upset or yelling on behalf. And I think I've been on that end of the spectrum before. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. Like, um, to be honest with you, I don't agree with, with that part that Dr. Walter Longo says. I do believe in the fasting part, but I just wanted to get your take on it because from what I've learned everything about dairy, dairy is very unhealthy. Okay, and, and so here's, here's the thing that we have to be fair to our listeners and to anybody who's considering veganism is in talking, talking about traditions and ideals. We've grown up, as you said before, not knowing that we can survive on a whole food plant-based diet. I used to think that if I stopped eating meat, I would die. And I bet you a lot of people think that. People, when, when I met Andrew at the dog park, he, that's who kind of sparked my interest. Yeah. I was so skeptical and I went, what? We can't. No. Yeah. And I never thought about veganism before in my life or eating just plants. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I was eating paleo at the time, which is heavy meat, heavy eggs. Like I was eating five to eight eggs yeah. a day. So yeah. it's not like I was born and raised vegan. Exactly. Most of us, most of us weren't. And that's my point. My point is that people, number one, need to be uh, informed and educated that we can have a, a long, if not longer life uh, having a plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet, ideally, and avoiding animal products. People think, if I can use myself an example, that they need to have these, this dairy, these eggs, this meat to live. Well, there's a lot of lobbying and media. And like, if you think about where the money's going, yeah, uh, there is a lot of lobbyists in the government to try to change even IPCC reports, which is like a climate change report. Um, or to try to affect our our uh, food guide. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's and also the media plays into it, and who owns the media or oh. who's paying the media, and then what? But like you know, you ever see like butter's back or bacon's back, and bacon's okay to eat. It's still a class one carcinogen at the end of the day, and then we're just completely ignoring the victim involved, which is the pig. But then if you want, you can also go into the human rights issues of workers in slaughterhouses and we force uh, even immigrants coming in because Canadians don't want to do those jobs. And uh, so there's so many different problems with this system. The more we look at it and it intersects with other different types of social justice movements. Yeah, yeah. There's so there's so many problems, you know, and I think we need to find the common value. For example, you know that there's whole food plant based, as you know, and then there's the ketogenic diet. You know that people think that they're opposites. Because the one focuses on plants, the other one focuses on animal products. But other than, there's a lot of similarities between them. One is that they avoid processed food. They avoid processed food, and the only difference is that a, a, a vegan, vegan diet, animal-based diet, uses animal protein, whereas a plant-based diet uses plant protein. So they're both using pro- proteins, but just getting them from different sources. But they're avoiding processed food. So there are a lot of similarities other than that, you know, from the diet perspective. I really think that vegan activism is very important and i see a lot of the vegan activists um you know like for example earthling ed he doesn't argue with people he's very calm and he explains everything and he gets to the you know ethic ethical part of it you know all that stuff and then there's other guys who are also pretty level-headed but then you know they start kind of arguing with people i think people have a bad uh connotation of, of veganism when you have that kind of demonstrations now, and it might work for some people, but uh, I think a lot of people probably rather channel their inner earthling ed. Or in my case, I don't think being the angry person helps me. And I think that's more important than exactly. I don't think I'm going to uh, create the change that I want to see in this world mm-hmm. if I'm just angry all the time. And then I think I kind of retreat into my own little suffering instead of being that shining light. Exactly. That, that's the way you got to look at it. You know, that's the way you have to look at it. So, Michael, yeah, I just, I just basically gave you my confession, you know. So, I, I really wholeheartedly believe in veganism. And like I said, I know where the, the products come from. And, you know, after this, this talk, I really think I'm going to uh, reflect on myself even more and, uh, you know, try to avoid those 100%. Because it's not about the foods, like you said, it's about the exploitation. And I don't believe in exploitation of any, any living being. And there's a vegan version of all our foods. Like that's what I've discovered is if I want that, I can probably make it vegan somehow. Like whether it's using a mushroom or whether it's using something else, or if I don't like this certain vegan cheese, I'll try another one or I can make it or, or whatever. So I, I think with, with, with all the foods that you enjoy, we can just make it vegan. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Like I said, I I'm like ninety ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent plant based. It's just those those couple of times, and I try to hold myself to these high standards, you know. Because I, but I'm not a vegan activist, you know. I I support veganism, and that's why I said I'm a borderline vegan, uh, and you know that I'm basically all all the way across the border. I think it's it's important that you know where where does this come from? Though we have to look at what's important. Is it our diet? So if we look at it from the diet perspective, I want to focus you know, a little bit more on diet because that's where I, I come from a lot uh, in health. The blue zones are places in the world that people live you know, long, right? They live into the 90s and 100s very healthily without taking a lot of medication, uh, without being sick. And their diet is 95% plant-based. So they might have some seafood. They might have a little bit of animal products. I'm not exactly sure how much they have. But it's definitely a rarity. It's, it, for them it's, it's definitely it's, a rarity yeah. exactly that's what i'm saying it's definitely a rarity but my point is if your um source of your goals comes from from the ethical part from veganism then it's easier then then all those other things fall in line because when i started this i did it for health reasons and then when i did it i'll just tell you how this happened to me health reasons first as i mentioned to you because i had a, a medical issue and then as i start started doing this i said wait a minute I believe wholeheartedly in avoiding animal cruelty. And so that's when I got in, when I saw the videos and understanding more about veganism, because before, to be honest, when I heard veganism, I didn't even know what it was. I'm like, what's a vegan? Like, I used to, to call it vegan. I said, what's a vegan? And I didn't even know. You know, it's like I'm living like an ostrich, like you say, you know, with, like I said, with my head in the sand. But since that time, this whole world has opened up to me. And I've always had that feeling, as I mentioned to you before, where I always cared about animals. Like when I was a kid, I, I, I was born on a farm in Greece. We had the chickens, we had the cows. You know, I saw some animal cruelty there and I never never liked it. But then as you grow up and you're eating, you know, the, the, the traditional foods that we eat, you're like, oh, this is normal. And you just, again, disconnect from it. So I think if people come from a place of morals and ethics and they say, you know, I care about these animals first. And then what happens as a side effect is they'll be healthier. And they also help help our, our the earth, because all these things fall into place. So I think when you when you start from a perspective of uh, you know non exploitation of animals, then you get all these these uh, benefits. Whereas when you start from let's say the health perspective, you're looking at just from my perspective. Like from if I'm looking at it to get my my health, I may not you know understand veganism to that point, and I and I, and I may never get to that point. But I'm sure sure glad that I got to that point that I could see the light. Yeah, I think some people have gotten into plant-based eating. They call themselves vegan, but they never really get to the ethics. Or I kind of looked at it as I, I saw a poster once, like when I first went vegan, and it said like vegan for everything. And it had all this stuff like wildlife and everything. And I, I kind of realized it was just solely about animals. But then if it said on the poster environment, I'm like, well, what are the environmental impacts of what are mm -hmm. what what we're doing? The fact that we can actually feed probably the entire planet if we shifted food systems to a predominantly plant-based food system. But then also, how does wildlife get affected? You know, we kill wildlife to protect livestock. I care a lot about wildlife. I think it's amazing to see uh, animals just act mm -hmm. naturally in the mm -hmm. way they're supposed to. Uh, I think it's fascinating watching documentaries, and I love being out in nature. I think it's a great thing for our mental health to get outside. Um, but then whenever I, I see animals, it's, I'm never salivating for them. If you see a hurt animal on the street, you're never like, oh, let me go. That's dinner now. Like you want to help them out, right? <laughs> no, I or hope you not. Bring them, I hope not. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You have a heart. You have a heart, you know, and, uh, but it's definitely an education process behind it. So I, I think that like, it's important to just keep going at it. Like we can constantly get new things like new information and, yeah. uh, we have to, you know, discern for ourselves and really take that into account or reflect on it, like you said. Yeah, you have to be willing to open your mind and your heart. And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, all the land animals, and I mentioned it too before, but there's about, I'm going to say 8 billion people on Earth, okay? It's 7 billion something. And the number of land animals, sorry, farm animals killed every year is 80 billion, more or less, right? Let's say 70 or 90, we'll say 80. Well, that's the ones that we keep track of. The ones that we keep yeah. track of, right? And doesn't include the, the, the fish and all that stuff. I want to add on to your point is when you have 10 times as many uh, farm animals that are being killed for our food, there's a lot of land that's being used to produce crops to feed these animals, right? You've got the, the corn, you've got the soy. I think that's what they, you know, they, they feed them. And there's I think it's about 83% of uh, 
our farmland is used solely just to feed animals 83%. or for animal agriculture. And it only returns us maybe 18% back in calories, something like that. I don't know if that's the, the stats exactly, mm. Mm. Uh, but it's not really great return. Like if you do the math, mm. uh, it doesn't really. No, no, exactly. And, and we have to think like how much waste those animals are creating. So every pig on a, in a shed on a pig farm, every chicken or, and turkey and cow, that's creating urine and manure and where is that going? And then we spray it onto fields. It runs off into our lakes and rivers and oceans. It creates ocean dead zones, which affects the ocean. And there's acidification yeah. and, and it's just a whole process. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. People have to really you know, research that. Like it goes into the Gulf of Mexico, for example, in the States. And you get all these dead fish coming up on the beaches because I think it's the nitrates in the excrement. When it goes into the water, all the algae eat the nitrates, and there's no algae left for the fish. I might be wrong, but I think that's kind of how I understand Well, that. there's algae blooms in Lake Erie, and what, what is that from? Is it just from fertilizer? Is it from all the waste runoff? And, for sure it's for, and, the, for and, the waste. And, you know, how farmers spraying that all. And we want to tackle that problem, but we're not getting to the root cause of these problems. Mm -hmm. So the, one other point I wanted to make is the world hunger. Like, do you have any idea the number of people that are don't have enough food to, to eat? today? Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Yeah. And sometimes I, I used to remember more like stats and numbers, but yeah, I, I just I, want, I just want to see if you help because I think it's close to, I think, I don't want to say a billion, but I mean, I thought it was like around 800 million. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, like, sure. Yeah, like, I, so I don't okay, want to be, so, I don't want to so say like stats and be wrong. So I think know. we're right. I think it's around 800 million because I was thinking close to a billion. But the point I'm, I wanted to make is if we didn't have to feed these 80 farm, 80 billion farm animals, we'd be able to solve world, world hunger tomorrow. Well, well and that's that, that, but that's if we take away human greed too. We'd yeah. have we could feed the world. We yeah. could probably feed. I forget what what it, how many more billions of people we could feed. Exactly. But exactly. if we could feed eighty billion land animals, without getting too much into stats, and if we think of the math of that, if we move towards sustainable uh, plant based food systems, we can feed the world. Yeah. We could probably feed double our. You're right. Population. You're 100 percent right. And so then people, some, some people ask, well, wait a minute, if there's 80 billion land animals and you all of a sudden stop eating them, what's going to happen to all these land animals? Well, they're not all in existence at the same time. We, we breed them into existence. Exactly. Uh, so, I just want you to get that point out. Yeah, you know, and so there, there, would, there would need to be a transition as well. Like, I don't think it's going to change overnight. And no. uh, even though there's like, there's three uh, animal sanctuaries in this area, mm -hmm. But that's not the answer. The answer isn't putting all these animals. I think the answer is getting away from domestication of animals, allowing animals to, allowing wildlife to come back. If you look at the numbers of wildlife that exist mm -hmm. and look at how many, like how much uh, farm animals exist com in comparison and then how many humans there mm -hmm. are, we need to bring back wild spaces and start rewilding and and we could free up a lot of farmland. I think it's like 75% of our farmland can be freed up if we shift away from uh, animal products and move towards obviously all these animals don't e exist mm. at the same time they're being bred right but be we'd slow that down and we'd have a transition over into right. plant-based systems that's it exactly yeah they just wouldn't need to be bred as many animals as they do now exactly and i don't think everyone's going to go vegan overnight either exactly. so it, that's the and, other and thing. that's where i come from like i said i believe 100 110 percent veganism but you got to know the everyday person and from all these reasons that we talked about is I think people, you know, if they can't go 100%, they just, just gradually turn the light on, you know, because if they're willing to learn and willing to empathize and willing to understand, I think more people uh, would consider going to veganism or at least reducing their animal products by 90, 95%. Like if people could today reduce their, their animal products by 95%, tomorrow the healthcare system in the United States and Canada wouldn't be broken, right? It would just you know, solve all these chronic medical conditions. But Steve, what about the people that make money in those systems? <laughs> so, so that is a good one. So I'm part of that system, right? So I'm a pharmacist, right? I'm an independent pharmacist. And I'm glad you brought that up, Michael, because, you know, you're talking about big pharma. You're talking about, like, I work for the illegal drug cartel. That's, I, that's, how, that's how I say it. The, the legal drug cartel is bigger than the illegal drug cartel. And so I work for them. And so what I do is, you know, truthfully, what pharmacists do is we, we uh, make money from people suffering, right? We get our livelihood from people suffering by having these chronic diseases. I'm not talking about people that have infections or people that have, you know, uh, arthritis or things that 
you know, medication that's used to, to treat these acute problems or pe people, let's say, that have, you know, childhood leukemia and they get treated. OK, th that's very necessary. But I'm glad you brought this up is, you know, these chronic diseases are not necessary and they're killing the healthcare system. And so where do these come from? These, these things come from, number one, big food, ultra processed food. Right. And number two, uh, th this big food is feeding big pharma and big medicine. And it's all supported by big government. If you think about it, and I'm sure you, you have. So there's yeah. a few good documentaries on it too. Yeah, which ones would you recommend? Uh, there's one called "I Think They're Trying to Kill Us." Okay. Um, and it really goes into the in the United States how they have set up in uh, poor demographics, um, predominantly like like uh, in Chicago, L.A., yeah, New York. Yeah, where you don't have access to a grocery store, but they have access to Popeyes and KFC exactly. and, and Burger King and the convenience store, and they can't get health food. And so this is a big problem, too, that I think we can also address with veganism, and we shouldn't ignore. But we need to address these food systems and give people access to these healthy foods. But it's almost like they want you sick. You know what? You're, you're right. It's, they're, they're, not, they're not trying to kill you, but they won't stop you from killing yourself. And they give you all these things, like giving you loaded guns, you know, with bullets in them. Basically, that's what the, those fast foods are. They, and you know that they're subsidized. These fast food, ultra-processed foods are subsidized by the government so that the price is cheaper than, than broccoli, mm -hmm. cheaper than fruits and Wouldn't vegetables. Wouldn't it be amazing to start changing subsidies over to plant-based yeah. agriculture? Yeah, but the problem is that the money, the, the wheel will stop turning for these people that have so many interests, right? Big pharma, big food, uh, big medicine. You know how many surgeries... You know how many amputations go on for people that are diabetics that have had, uh, you know, uh, dialysis uh, because of the food? You know, um, there's so many surgeries going on. Of course, the doctors that are, that are doing it, they're not thinking, okay, I want my patients to be sick. I want them to suffer. But the system has been set up, as you so correctly said, for people to get sick. But Steve, it sounds like what we're talking about here is something radical or something that, you know, we almost need a revolution to change. But... I don't know if it can be done in this system that we currently live under, and that's how can we do it? Yeah. Other than a revolution, how can we do it? I don't know. There's there is gotta find there is answer. a lot of people working towards it. Yeah? yeah, you know what? There has to be because what's happening is people have their lifespan, and you know the average person lives about up till eighty, but they don't have the the health span. The health span doesn't last as long as their lifespan. A lot of people are sick in their last 10, 15, 20 years of their life taking medication, you know, insulin, heart medication, diabetic medication, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory medication, because as you mentioned before, animal products cause so much inflammation, autoimmune conditions. So, I mean, we're just a sick society. And, you know, the way I, the way I really look at it is I call it black and white. I call it black and white and I say, there's, there's foods that are healthy for you, they, they cause health, and there's other foods that cause illness. And I don't just classify animal products in that. I also classify, obviously, processed and ultra-processed food, anything that our body wasn't made to eat. So those, those things uh, are called poisons. I call them poisons. So, you know, if you want to poison your body by eating, you know, excessive animal products, by drinking dairy, by, by uh, eating processed foods, the medical system is waiting there to catch you. They're waiting there with open arms. Right. And that's that's how it is. And yeah, there's got to be a solution. We got to find a solution. You're the guy that, that's going to do it, I think. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Anyways, that was a great discussion uh, so far. I'm really enjoying this. How about you? Yeah, it's Not great. Bad? Yeah. I can see that you're so knowledgeable and so passionate about it. So the next question is this. It's a very important one. And I want to spend quite a bit of time on as much as you want. Sure. Uh, tell me about the journey, about your journey that led you to become a vegan. Well, in 2016... I ended up going on a dog sledding trip mm -hmm. or in other terms, I could say I exploited a dog for my own entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, it was six hours up north mm -hmm. and I ended up meeting a dog named Bubba. Mm -hmm. He captivated my attention and my heart right from the beginning. He was different from every other dog there. Mm -hmm. uh, when we stopped for lunch, uh, he was the only dog that wasn't barking because they mm -hmm. all wanted to keep going, which... A lot of times in the dog sledding industry, they use the excuse that they love to run. But what dog wouldn't love to run, especially like this kennel was 400 dogs chained up out, oh. outside in a barren field with no shade. It 
really reminded me of when I started looking into the dairy industry and you see like calf hutches or calves being separated, which not all dairy operations do, but like I kind of said, mm-hmm. uh, I'm kind of going off topic here, but okay. kind of really reminded me of that, like the similarities of seeing a calf chained up to how Bubba was chained up. He captivated me on this trip. It was a two-day trip I went on, mm-hmm. and I came back home and I emailed the owner right away and I wanted to adopt him. He was not eligible for adoption at the time. Um, he kind of talked about how uh, it would be like another two years. He was already eight years old at the time. Mm-hmm. So I was looking to get him maybe, I had to save up for a house. So I ended up working at Chrysler, got out of debt, saved up for a house, bought a house. And then I, I found out that the owner of the kennel passed away and they were downsizing their kennel. I ended up going up there a year earlier than I thought I would get him. And he was nine years old at the time. So I adopted him and started going to the dog park. And through that, I met a vegan bodybuilder. His name was Andrew. We just had conversations and he never really pushed it. He was so never you, like you that. weren't vegan at that time? I wasn't vegan at the okay, time. Just, uh, I, I was I mean, a dog lover. Uh, yeah, I you guess fell in love with the dog. I fell in love with <laughs> Bubba. Okay. Like, okay. I guess you can say it like that. Like I might not love every animal or every dog, but I definitely right. loved Bubba. Okay. Yeah, I met Andrew through the dog park. He also adopted a, his first dog was a sled dog. So that's how we connected. Oh, okay. And we just started having chats. And I was very skeptical. He sparked my interest. I watched What the Health. Mm-hmm. The next day, I cut out animal products. There was a few times there where I still had some stuff in my freezer that maybe I tried and then gave it to Bubba or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and this was before, like, now his sister, like, I also have his sister, uh, Burke, and she's fully plant-based. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, she eats a plant-based diet. She's 15 cool. years old. Okay. So that tells you right there that a, that a dog can survive <laughs> on a plant-based diet. Well, if I want to be a part of this change, right? Yeah. Um, and dogs are domesticated. Like we get that story that they're like wolves and they need to eat that way. Well, dogs have been domesticated and have grown beside us. And where where I'm at, where some people go, hey, you're vegan. Why do you have a dog? And I go, we've created this problem by domestication or there's hundreds of of thousands probably of dogs suffering across Canada in dog sled kennels. If I can adopt them and give them a home, mm-hmm. that's the best I can do right now with the resources right, available. Right, right. Yeah. Like th- the domestication is a whole nother topic of discussion. Right. So anyways, back to kind of like my journey, I ended mm-hmm. up going and eating a fully plant-based diet. And then I started calling myself vegan then, but then I didn't, I think I didn't really understand what it was, mm-hmm. but I was on that pathway to figuring it out. So I started following uh, activists on social media and I started following doctors on social media. And I think social media was a great tool for me back then to be like, well, where do I find this information? Mm -hmm. And then I just started watching documentary after documentary, um, to kind of get more knowledge. And then just even watching, uh, animal activists in Canada show what farms are like, or even experiencing that for myself and realizing, okay, there is no you know, good farm or good place. Or I tried to justify like, oh, this kennel that Bubba came from, they must have been a good place. When in reality, I went, well, we're still using him for entertainment Mm -hmm. instead of seeing him as an individual. So I think that was a huge part of my growth. I don't know if I was always supposed to meet him. Like, you know, you ever think that people come into your life? Well, if we give personhood back to animals, I think that's where I really started seeing that. And I think what really broke me down is there was a non-graphic footage of a cow going into a slaughterhouse. They know the cow in front of them was killed and they start backing up and they look behind at the camera. Mm-hmm. And I kind of saw Bubba in the cow mm-hmm. and I broke down crying uh, and I had a really hard time. And I think that's when I really started reflecting and I went, you know what? I don't want to cause suffering to other beings uh, and other animals. And I don't want to be that, that person. And I'm already knowing that I can do it another way. Cause I already started eating fully plant-based mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's when I truly became vegan was after making that connection, but also just reading books and using social media to try to educate myself as much as possible on the topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I don't know if that sums it up. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful um, process, a beautiful journey. Uh, yeah, Bubba showed me the personhood in all animals. Yeah, and you know what, what's interesting is we have a lot of uh, dog lovers that call themselves animal lovers, but you've made uh, the jump all the way. Like you've, the way I, I, I describe what you've done is um, not only have you become uh, conscious about that in the world, but it's kind of like a universal consciousness where you've connected 
your your empathy and feelings, not just for a dog, but for all animals. And I think that's huge. Uh, so congratulations on doing that. And I think when when somebody feels like that, like I think I feel like that. I mean, you know, I can. I, I, it's hard for me to describe how how I feel 100. percent But I really feel for all all sort all, all forms of life. Your story is really fantastic because many people, they kind of put a line between, okay, I'm an animal lover and I love dogs, but then it's okay for me to eat the cow or it's okay for me to eat the pig or the chicken. How do you, uh, you know, get rid of that, that line in the middle? So the way I kind of think about it is we don't even need to be animal lovers or love all animals. I know that I love some human animals, <laughs> which my family <laughs> and, <laughs> and some of my friends, and that I've loved, you know, the dogs in my life like Bubba and Burke. But I don't need to have love for all animals. And, and, and even though it comes from a place of love, and I believe that love is a, uh, mm-hmm. broader than we think it is, I don't think we need to have that in order to respect them, mm-hmm. in order to give them their life, to, ha- to allow them to have rights. Uh, but we've taken that away from them completely. So whether someone's an animal lover or not, if they're an animal lover or they believe that, reflect and look into that but it's it's up to them to make that uh i can there's nothing that i can say here on this podcast that can change anyone's mind it's Mm. up to uh them themselves to discover that uh but i kind of believe that we don't need to be you don't even need to be an animal lover in order to respect animals uh you know we're we're taking everything away from them we're controlling every aspect of their life we're sexually exploiting them uh in order for these uh, products and like whether it's food or or you know we go to zoos and uh, aquariums and you you described it and defined it perfectly you said you don't have to be an animal lover because you don't know all these animals throughout the world respect is key respect in any relationship is key you said respect uh, and also I'm going to add morals mm-hmm. you know like what kind of morals do we have um, you know again just because we disconnect from what's happening to the animals, does that mean it's right? You know, we don't know those animals, you know, but we do know what's what's happening to them. All we have to do is watch these videos and, you know, listen to activists and, you know, go on the internet, all that stuff. And I kind of think of what I said too before is like, I've loved some humans and I've loved some animals. And like, uh, like I think us humans, we tend to forget. I've had discussions before and people go, oh, we're not animals. And I'm like, well, what are we? And then people go, oh, we're a mammal. And I'm like, yeah. Well, what's a mammal? Yeah. It's an animal. And it, so it's, it's kind of like, do I need to love everyone or can I have love for everyone? Because it's very difficult. Like uh, with humans, it's very difficult. I, I find it very easy to be uh, connected more to animals or when you go to a mm-hmm. sanctuary. With humans, it's hard. We have discussions and arguments and uh, more clashes, I think. But we can respect each other. And I think we need to respect our point of views and come together and start having conversations that are constructive because we're, if we're not listening to each other uh, and when we don't realize that we have more in common than there's, there's than, nothing uh, I can add to that. That was just beautiful. Absolutely respect. And then uh, you also mentioned rights, you know, you know, the animals have their rights, right to life. That's beautiful. So tell me about vegan activism, activism. Do you consider yourself an activist and what type of activism do you do? I do consider myself an activist. So after I adopted two dogs from the dog sledding kennel, Mm -hmm. I went up there and I got three more dogs out of the kennel before they fully closed. I ended up fostering uh, one of them uh, and the other one got adopted and just lived around the corner from me. I volunteered at a few animal sanctuaries and I kind of dipped my toe into all different types of form of activism. So yes, there is marches and there's disruptions and, you know, standing on a corner or, mm. you know, even street outreach. But there's also, what, what do we define as activism? What about the person that's, a, you know, in animal rights or is vegan for those reasons, but just decides that they want to cook and they want to show people what to eat? Because if you don't know what to eat, people might go, I'm not doing this. I don't know how to eat plant-based. Is that an activist? the person that sits at home on their computer, I don't like getting into the comment section. Mm. I actually, that's terrible for my own mental health, but someone's good at that. And someone might be able to handle, you know, typing on a keyboard and, you know, explaining that. So mm. there's so many different types of forms of activism. And I don't think that we should say that one's, you know, this or that. I think we all, we need all of them. I don't think any of them are necessarily bad. I think we do need certain things. And there's certain more intense forms of activism that I do think are necessary to push things into media 
and to push the conversation into the general public. And that could be farm occupations. And there's usually always a legal protest at the same time, which would be like standing at the side of the road and you're allowed to protest like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a great description. It, it just, it's not just one thing. Uh, you mentioned restaurants. Like, I, th I, I agree. And again, I got this idea from my daughter. I agree with a lot of things she says. Um, even if you open up a plant-based uh, vegan restaurant, that is a form of activism because you're saying, hey, here are alternatives to what you're normally used to eating. You know, we talked about um, there's some vegan restaurants here in Windsor. They're called vegan. They're not called plant-based, right? Like there's a Copper Branch. There's the one that you advert, uh, not advertise, but you promote on your Facebook. What's oh, it called Nooch. on Erie Street? Nooch. Yeah. You like, is that your favorite one? Um, I think it's a great, like, vegan comfort food place. Yeah, yeah. And uh, probably great for, like, I, like that's where I would bring most of like my meat eater friends yeah. and it's what what you're kind of used to like gyros and rubens and burgers mm. and stuff like that so I think it can be a, a, a great thing or people might just go wow this is vegan like yeah. I didn't know that you could make it like yeah that. yeah I think it's it's also I don't want to call it you know junk food but it is a transition from yeah it's more like pub based. style or comfort, yeah, pub style. comfort food yeah like, there's yeah. also healthy mamas and th those kind of places but you can also find uh, plant-based food just to go to any restaurant you know, you can just tell them I want, you know, a salad without cheese. I mean, if people start ordering those kind of foods and they don't order the animal products, there's going to be less less demand. So going back to, to the question about uh, activism, though, um, I think what you're doing is fantastic. You know, you you've this gone, podcast could be activism, but yeah, exactly. That's that's what we're trying to do here too. You know, and I don't know if I'm willing to do this anymore, but um, there was a few years ago that I was willing to actually go into a, a turkey farm. Mm -hmm. to uh, live stream and show the Canadian public. And this was right before, <laughs> the weekend before uh, uh, Thanksgiving, to show them this is where 90% yeah. of the Canadian grocery store turkeys come from. I've, I've taken a step back from doing a lot of things because I, mm. I do believe that I kind of wasn't focusing. I was focused so much on activism and changing stuff that I was mm -hmm. think I was getting angry and projecting. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't taking care of myself. And there's other things that were underlying that. Mm -hmm. And I needed to start getting back to taking care of myself. So I do think activism burnout can be real and we need to be careful. And I think if you want to do certain forms, I kind of agree with certain people where let's make it strategic. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to do street outreach, well, let's not just do street outreach alone. There needs to be maybe a pressure campaign behind that. So for example, fur. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna if we're gonna put a proposal through Windsor to ban the sale of fur in Windsor, mm. well, there would be street outreach. Then would be effective and to explain to the general public in Windsor why that would be a good idea for Windsor or just in general why it's bad to mm -hmm. uh, sell fur. So I think that's a strategic way to do something or or remove something from our society that we might go, hey, that's kind of unethical. Let's stop mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a certain role to play. As I mentioned this to you when we were talking one, one time, the one time on the phone. And, you know, whatever you can do as a, as a person, like this podcast is going to serve as uh, activism purpose uh, because obviously our goal is to promote veganism and, and animal welfare. Something like, like uh, the fur demonstration, you know, that would be great. But you could just be, I don't want to, I'm not going to buy any fur coats. Like I was looking for a wallet on Amazon and I made sure not to buy one with leather. Or we're looking at getting a new car, make sure to buy one that's, you know, synthetic leather, right? So just everybody, it's not that not everybody has to do the same thing. Well, I believe it's important that, you, like right, you said there, everyone has a role to play. Yeah. And everyone, I think it's important to step out of your comfort zone and try different mm -hmm. things. But at the same time, there are different things that we can do that like, like that's what I'm trying to find right now. And I think I know exactly where I want to go and what I want to do with activism going forward. But I think it's, I found my role and I want to continue doing that. And it's good for my mental health. And I think that that's, like I said, with someone that can type on a keyboard, I don't want to get into the comment section. I think the comment section on social media is very toxic a lot mm -hmm. of times. And other, pe other people are better at that than me. So that's not for me. So it's kind of like that role, you know, or if you're a vegan chef and sharing the recipes, that's their role. Would I like to see them at a, maybe a march for animals? Sure. Mm -hmm. And a march would be like, I think kind of low on the level of like intensity of what uh, some of the other protests that I've attended or what we've done. Mm -hmm. Like um, we did uh, shut down a chicken slaughterhouse in Toronto for six hours. And I was a part of a group of people that did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was four chickens that were rescued and sent to an animal sanctuary.
Yeah. Well, all the power to, you know, the, the people like, like yourself that have done those kind of things, you know, those lead activists and people that participate in demonstrations. That leads me to the next question you mentioned about the chicken farm. Uh, let's talk about industrialized factory farming in terms of exploitation, cruelty, as well as uh, health risks to humans. Industrialized factory farming, we can look up the, how do you word it? The industry standard practices mm -hmm. are abhorrent. They're so cruel just to begin with that when we look at how we, you know, what we do to pigs in the industrial farming system, how we kill them in Canada, like we're allowed to CO2 gas them. There's other methods as well, but like people just think, oh, they peacefully go to sleep. That's not what happens. I've seen the footage. I'm probably traumatized by watching it too many times. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that I need to process. What we're doing to these pigs, cows, chickens, turkeys, all these other animals that are stuck in these systems, we're exploiting them sexually. We're killing males almost instantly. Males are considered useless to the industry. Uh, dairy cows, normally they, like they end up going to the slaughterhouse after five years. So if you mm -hmm. think of the life of a dairy cow, it's uh, pregnancy after pregnancy after pregnancy continuously to keep up their production of milk. Because the babies can't be taking their milk, we take it away because, like, you know, we want ice cream instead of just having mm. the vegan option. Mm. And then they're sent to the slaughterhouse after that production declines. So they're still going there. And even if it's on a nice farm, that cow still uses a commodity and being sent there. So regardless of welfare, we're just doing this. And when we look at it as, like, what, what are we doing to these animals? How are we sexually exploiting them? Like, because we're breeding them. Like, if you look in, I don't know if you want me to get really into it, but, like, you can do it. E even, like, pigs, you'll see a farmer, you know, collect semen from a boar. I'm using nicer terms. Yeah. Uh, and then they're using a tube to put it into the female, and they'll use the boar to get the female yeah. excited. We're breeding them. Turkeys, they're so big now, they can't even breed naturally. So a farmer pretty much diddles a male turkey to collect their semen and then puts a tube into the female. Yeah. And so it's, it's this sexual exploitation. I find it gross. Well, I, I, and I'm aware of that. I agree with you 100%. I mean, like in, in bulls, they'll actually, they can use an electrical stimulation rod to get them to ejaculate. Mm -hmm. Right? So all these things, I mean, that's, you know, rape, you know, when they, when they do that kind of stuff. Essentially, so, yeah. And that could and be a triggering word for a lot of people, but it, essentially it is... You know, when you see a farmer using, like, they're putting their hand down the anal cavity to grab onto the, I yeah. think, what is it, the cervix? So they can so, in, yeah. inject the yeah. semen. Yeah. And even it, if they're doing it naturally, you're still taking that baby away. You're still using them as a, it, as a commodity. The word I used was a triggering word, but you know what? We got to call it out. If, if people are going to be aware of what's going on, you, you need to know the, the horror that's going on in the slaughterhouses. And um, not just the slaughterhouses, but like the industry stranded practices. <clears throat> but like when you have. So I've been outside uh, in vigils, and right. when you see like birds coming from a, um, you know, ten thousand birds in one one truck, those ten thousand birds were might have been all in one uh, shed. Right. They're living in their own ammonia. They have ammonia burns all, or like they're living in their own waste. So then it creates ammonia, which then creates burns on their. Uh, skin, they're missing mm -hmm. feathers, they look sick, they don't look healthy, they look like they're struggling to breathe. Chickens are only 35 days old, maybe a little bit older by the time they're sent to the slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. When they're there, they look like they're struggling. Like they're, they, they probably have so small hearts compared to the body because we've, we've changed these animals to grow so big so fast. Pigs are only six months old. Yeah, um, they don't get to leave, live their whole life. For example, chickens, they cut their beaks, first of all, so they don't peck each other. Yeah, because there's a pecking order, right? Yeah. So then there's too many in one shed, and, and then they go, okay, well, we're going to... And secondly, they, they inject them with steroids to get them to be nice and plump, to have the big, you know, the big chicken breast and all that stuff. And like you said, that's not the normal growth cycle of a chicken. No, and I think there's a lot of greenwashing and humane washing, mm -hmm. especially in our marketing. What's that? Uh, like, humane washing would be like, you kind of are claiming, or like you see the happy cow picture, or you see the picture of a farm that's nice. Old, old or, McDonald's or, farm, man. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, people yeah. have that bucolic view of what a farm is. Yeah, the romantic like. view. The romantic and, view. And we think that that's <clears throat> still what's happening, where and like it's, not. it's like, I think it's like 98% of the products in the United <clears throat> States, I'm sure it's very similar in Canada. All of those products in the grocery store are coming from factory farms. Right. And even if they aren't, it still doesn't <clears throat> make it right. It, it's still. Uh, 
you're, you're still using that animal at the end of the day. You're right. You're right. And that goes back to the uh, ethics and the morals. But you're right. I think it's close to 98, 99%. But I don't know if, if people start eating plants, would they view it differently? Would they seek out that footage? I think that footage is important. It can be traumatizing. Well, like I said, in my own journey, that's how I kind of started off. I, I was eating a lot of plants before. Like in the Greek cuisine, we have a lot of, you know, beans and green beans and navy beans and potatoes and all that stuff. So I was like used to eating that. So for me, it was kind of an easier transition. But then I started seeking out these these videos. Once I became aware of them, I'm like, wait a minute. Like I always knew that, that it was going on, but I never sat down to pay close attention, you know, to movies. And we'll talk about them later, such as, uh, you know, Hope, such as Dominion. I mean, uh, Earthlings. You know those kind of things so and the other comment i can make about uh animals in this industrialized food system is that they're all individuals so i think how i view it is i can see bubba or i can see myself in each animal so instead of just talking about how it's ten thousand birds in one shed or you know x amount of pigs or cows or wherever in a feed lot each one of those animals is an individual at the end of the day and we forget that those are the victims of our choices those are the ones that are paying the price and the brunt. So yeah, it could be traumatizing for us to maybe watch that footage, but I think it's important for us to face that so we can see what our actions are actually uh, yeah, no, doing. You're right, you're right. It's because we don't name them. We don't give them an individual name. So it's okay, there's a, gr a bunch of pigs, there's a bunch of chickens, right? And there, there's no personality there, but you're right. Each one is an individual and it has a right you know, to live its life the normal way it would have. So, it's, you know, all this information that you have and your feelings and your, your, your passion and your pathos is, is what uh, people need to hear. People need to listen to this. And, you know, maybe, maybe you can start a podcast one day, <laughs> you know, since you want to go into uh, videography and all that stuff. Uh, great conversation so far. Great conversation. Yeah, thanks, Steve. A little bit more about the, the factory farming. Uh, the, the cows, you mentioned the one cow who saw the, the cow in front of them getting killed and, and it was going to be scared i didn't want to get killed i mean they know what's going on right and i and i look at a simple example when when i take my dog to the vet <laughs> she pees on the floor she's scared yeah she knows yeah she knows even though she's gone there several times and you know every, they take care of her and everything she gets scared so you know god forbid i mean it's happening but imagine you know it's hard to imagine what these poor animals go through you know lining up trying to get out of the pens and this and that and again, it's because, you know, also, not, what does that do to the humans working in that system that d maybe don't want to work at a slaughterhouse or that's the only option or they're, you know, maybe they're criminals forced there. They yeah. even, they even make, uh, some, um, prisons have programs like oh, this. I didn't where, know that. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if, I think there might be some in Canada as well, but some prisons have programs where they make them run farms and slaughterhouses. And I, how is that rehabilitating anyone and, and getting them out? Yeah. Like it's a cycle of violence. That's what it is. It's violence and uh, it's horror. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. That's very interesting. Or you're, or you're forcing immigrants to work who, in, in this because, you know, normal Canadians might not want that yeah. uh, job. Who, who would really willingly want to take that kind of job? Like, you know, if we say most people are against cruelty. But you're right. I, I wasn't aware well, of that. Well, it brings up, like, PTSD. Like, so if we care about human animals, like, what about the people's PTSD or yeah. alcoholism or spousal abuse? when they work in this industry, look at the stats of those areas and how that skyrockets. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an important topic? Do we care about those people? Because a lot of people just go, oh, well, like someone else is doing it and it's kind of behind yeah. behind yeah. the curtain. But if slaughterhouses, you know, have you ever heard of slaughterhouses had glass walls? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where when we watch footage from activists, we can kind of gain an yeah. eye into that. And, and that's what people need to realize, that it's going behind the curtain but we're paying for it. So people say, well, I'm not, I'm not telling them to kill the animal. Yeah, but you are actually uh, providing the, the money for, them to, for you to support the industry. I think people really need to understand that. You know, instead of saying, well, you know, I'll just ignore what's happening there. I'm just going to eat my steak or my hamburger. Or no, we don't even think about it. Or we don't even think about it, you know. So we, we're having a lot of, uh, you know, good information uh, during this podcast. I think if people, uh, you know, take the time to listen to it. I think it'll really help people to, to see uh, animal welfare and animal cruelty in a different light. Anything more about uh, factory farming you want to talk about? At one point, I think I had a lot more to say about yeah. it, but it's just, um, I don't think it matters if it's factory farming or not, really. Yeah. I, I do think that if we look at the industry standard practices alone, mm -hmm. they're abhorrent enough and, and eye-opening enough 
there's been places that have been caught with legal animal abuse that have been caught on camera, whether it's through investigations or activists. But do we need that? Or can we just look at what the root is and how we've changed these animals and what we're, you know, systemically doing to them in these farms? But regardless, regardless of if it's a factory farm or not, uh, can we move past this use of animals? Yeah, you know what? I'm glad you, you brought that forward. That's a good thing to highlight because... It's not just the factory farms, it's just the farms in general. And then the farmers say, well, what are we going to do? We, we need to make a living. What, what's the answer to that? Can we help them transition to a plant-based system? Right. Uh, so if they don't have land to farm, like, can we do vertical farming? Can we do greenhouses? Can we do, we're creative, us humans. Yeah. We can figure out something out, I believe, to transition away from this, to transition to more, like, I just want to live in a more peaceful world. Can we get there? Yeah. And as long as slaughterhouses are open and as long as we keep doing this to animal, I don't know if we can move in that direction. Like, I love cooking uh, mushroom steak mm -hmm. from oh, uh, lion's yeah. mane or mm -hmm. from oyster mushrooms. You know, can you move into those systems where if it's not that, you're growing uh, fungi or something? There's money to be made in other industries can we start shifting subsidies over to these plant-based mm -hmm. systems to incentivize farmers to move to that? You Great. know, there's there's uh, dairy farmers that have gone to now doing oats or, mm -hmm. you know, and there's programs. There's even a woman in the States that does, helps farmers transition. So there has been some that have transitioned, yeah. eh? And there's a organization in Canada. I They just changed their name. So sorry if I get it wrong, but it's like Canadians for Responsible Food System Policy or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so they're working to to get the subsidies changed and to transition over into a plant based food system. Mm -hmm. No, no, you're right. Your 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 ideas are ideal. I mean, even if it's not factory farming, um, you know, uh, what, how do they call it when they kill an animal and it's not so? What's the term they use? Uh, humane. I mean, there is no killing that can be humane. Killing is killing, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not humane because you're killing an animal. You're killing a living being, and I think that's the way we really need to look at it so we can connect. With what's going on uh, let's talk about uh, some popular activists that we could discuss real real quickly sure um so before i begin i just want to say it's important that we don't place people on uh, pedestals uh so as activists like we've already mentioned we all have roles we mm -hmm. can fill yeah so sometimes i think we you know look at people like kind of like a celebrity but mm -hmm. uh they're just people just like us of course so two off the bat that i can mention is uh, amy serrano and nick schaefer they're part mm -hmm. of the excelsior four uh, about four years ago, there was Meet the Victims Canada. It mm -hmm. was one of the first Meet the Victims action in Canada. Uh, they exposed Excelsior Hog Farm. Um, so prior to this, they had uh, undercover footage from the farm that showed not only the industry standard practices, but criminal animal abuse. And then there was a farm occupation with about 50 activists that went inside the farm and 200 activists total. There was uh, a legal protest outside the farm. Mm -hmm. During the day, 50 activists were arrested, but only four of them were end up being charged. Actually, two of them, the charges were dropped, but Amy and Nick, they just had their trial. They're now appealing. But this happened in Canada. So I didn't know that exposing animal abuse in Canada was considered a crime. <laughs> but this is, uh, it's actually the shirt I'm wearing today is uh, of the Excelsior Four. Okay. On the back, it says liberate animals, decriminalize activists. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, you know, part of this action and I think what they're trying to do in Canada is make an example of them to try to stop these types of stuff from happening because it also gets into media it gets into the public eye and then that's where I think you start changing uh, uh, shifts in perception uh, there's Jenny McQueen and mm -hmm. the poor Greg 12 mm -hmm. so they did something similar uh, where they did an event where they exposed this pig farm in Quebec which is now shut down but the 12 of them are actually facing sentencing. I think they're yet to be sentenced. It might be uh, next month, I believe. Mm -hmm. It keeps getting delayed. Um, but this farm was just absolutely disgusting. And, you know, time and time again, activists keep doing this and exposing factory farms or these mm -hmm. industries. And uh, they're the ones that are bearing the brunt of it. Uh, sort of similar to how uh, ecological activists uh, were targeted or shut down. So the definition I use today of veganism came from uh, EA. So her name is spelled uh, I-Y-E. 
and uh, her Instagram is I loves life or E A loves life, but spelled I Y E. Hmm. I think she's incredible. You can learn uh, uh, about different types of like intersectionality when it comes to activism, uh, how it intersects with different things, and I think she's broadened my. Um, understanding of uh, veganism and just being plant-based. Uh, Nicholas Carter, he's a Canadian ecologist. He researches uh, land biodiversity, soil, and climate. He kind of combats the whole notion of this regenerative farming and the greenwashing behind that. And, and people easily can just say like, oh, yeah, look, I'm supporting regenerative farming. I think he's doing a lot of great work. Uh, there's Joanne MacArthur, another uh, Canadian. She's an animal photojournalist. Um, I hope I pronounced this right. It's uh, Aotearoa uh, Liberation League. They're out of New Zealand. I really like their videos, and uh, mm. I like what, what work they're doing in New Zealand. And then uh, Jake Conroy, he's known as the Cranky Vegan. He talks about uh, vegan activism and uh, gossip, but also strategies and using activism as a tool and combining different methods to make change. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few. There's so many to name. And and I think everyone, like I said, everyone has a part to play. And mm -hmm. um, so if I didn't mention you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you highlighted all these Canadians. Because, yeah, I, I because, tried to bring a bunch of Canadians yeah, yeah, into that, it. That's great. And uh, I wasn't aware of that. But, you know, it all stems down to the laws. I mean, here you have people that are being arrested, you know, waiting, you know, for their sentencing. And I, I saw this uh, blurb somewhere. It said, if you rescue a dog from a car, like from a hot car, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. But if you go and rescue some pigs, you're a criminal. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, right, you saved the lives, you're trying to save the life of both of these animals. And that's where I can never understand, and I never will, why we in North America, I'll say we, we love dogs and cats so much and like you say, love isn't always a word, it's respect, which I agree with you. But let's say we love, we're animal lovers, let's say. But yet, you know, we're okay when the other animals are killed. But are we? Because like in our society too, we, I think we tend to forget. Like, so we say we love cats and dogs, but then cats and dogs are also tested on in facilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we go to the store and buy these products that were tested on animals and right. those, all those animals end up being killed. Or, or like, you know, I exploited a dog for my entertainment, mm -hmm. which I could do other winter activities. I don't have to do that mm -hmm. winter activity. I can do mm -hmm. something else. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, like... Even like the zoo, like the zoo, for example, or the, or the circus, you know, all those things are just exploiting the animals. So you're right. I, mean, I think it's just, you know, the laws, you got to recognize the animal's rights and, you know, leave the word love out for, for a moment. Like you say, you can't love everybody and every, every person, every animal, but have the respect for for life and 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 you know recheck your morals but i think as you, you know? get more compassionate maybe everything is coming from a place of love and i think that's what i'm trying to get back in touch mm -hmm. in touch with or maybe that's how earthling ed stays uh in his uh zone or i don't know yeah. i haven't talked <laughs> yeah he said he said that he 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 had this awakening when he saw a bunch of chickens that were being brought to the, no a bunch of chickens that fell uh, on the highway and yes. he saw all these he's dying he's got a great book that came out i think last year uh, it's called, uh, it's vegan propaganda. Yeah. You know, I'd like to get it and read it. Yeah, yeah. Yet. Yeah, you got to check it out. So, Michael, we kind of mentioned this before, but I just wanted to uh, highlight something else about this question. So, are all animal lovers vegan? Why or why not? No, they're not. Uh, there's a lot of people that consider themselves animal lovers and they're not. And I think it's what you've talked about before in this podcast. Maybe it's that cognitive dissonance or uh, what I've mentioned before is just that kind of prevalent ideology in our society, we view certain animals in a different way. Mm -hmm. We all know about racism. We've been hearing about it so much in the last few years, and we know that it's wrong. But then when it comes to um, animals, there's something similar to racism called speciesism. And I'd like to you know, basically talk about what that means. Uh, so speciesism is the systemic oppression of non-human animals by humans. Uh, so in other words, it's human supremacy. So it's our domination, control, and determination to do whatever we wish to other animals, regardless of their species. So in other terms, is kind of we've taken away their personhood and we view them as things instead of actual breathing, living beings, as commodities, as that 
piece of flesh at the market or as that leather jacket or the shoes. Some people are confused and think maybe it's we love one but not the other, uh, but that's not what speciesism is. It's not like, hey, we love the dog and you know we don't love the pig. Mm. It's we dominate both of them. Like, you know, I've used a dog for entertainment in my life. Um, I've bought products that were tested on dogs. Uh, I've also eaten pigs. So it's not that, it's, it's, our, it's the oppression, like the systemic oppression of animals by us mm -hmm. humans mm -hmm. or human supremacy over them. Mm -hmm. It's like we feel we have dominion, God-given dominion over all these animals to do whatever we want with them. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. I think that's good to, to recognize uh, the next question I have is, uh, there's a, we mentioned documentaries before. Uh, what, which ones would you recommend to people to learn about veganism? I think one of the toughest ones to watch, but one of the most important ones to watch, or, or in my opinion, one of the most important ones, is called Dominion. Hmm. Uh, it is free on YouTube. It's two hours. I think it's important hmm. to get to the end of it because of the message in the film. A lot of people I hear can't get through the first five minutes, but I think it's something that you need to tough it out and, and kind of get to the end of it. And maybe we're more receptive to it when we're eating plants. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite documentaries that I've ever watched, whether it's as a vegan or not, but just I thought it was a really well done documentary. It was called On the Wild Side. Mm -hmm. It's uh, kind of anti-poaching, anti-hunting, but it also has a vegan message in there. And... I think certain people come to the real realization that, you know, they're part of family units and they're individuals. And it, it, really the connection was beautiful, but just a well done documentary. It might be hard to find. Unlike uh, Dominion is on YouTube for free. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where you can watch On the Wild Side right now, but an incredible documentary. And then there's another one, Eating Our Way to Extinction. It's maybe less about exactly veganism, but more about the environmental impacts of, you know, um, continuing to eat animal products and, uh, you know, what a plant-based diet, how that would affect the environment and kind of where we're headed with all these reports coming out and with climate change, which is really affecting the global south more than us right now first. So maybe we don't see it as much, even though there are certain events that are happening or you see certain like, you know, the, the once in a hundred year flood and then it's happening again. Mm. But the global south is more affected and eating our way to extinction, which I believe is now on YouTube for free as well. Uh, it might be on Amazon Prime. I think it's a great documentary so you can understand like the larger impacts of if you're not coming to it from an animal rights perspective and connecting to that, perhaps um, maybe look into the environmental impacts, something that we all need to mm -hmm. survive and live and breathe here. I mean, those are, those are the three reasons why people would consider uh, eliminating animal products. One is the health, the other one is uh, animal rights, and the other one is uh, the environment. Yeah, and so for, I mean, if you can't for, find one of those three reasons, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's an issue, right? Yeah, and for like if people want health documentaries, like there's always like the Game Changers, which mm -hmm. was a good one, Forks Over Knives. Um, yeah, there's so many. There's so what many. the health, yeah. Cowspiracy is kind of similar to Eating Our Way to Extinction. Eating Our Way to Extinction is kind of updated. Seaspiracy is good on Netflix. It goes into the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're all important. I've watched a lot of them, but yeah, yeah it's. I just wanted to pick a few that were maybe yeah, like. No, those stuck are excellent callouts, and you know what? Um, uh, for our podcast, you can you can list me all those, and we'll we'll list sure. them on the bottom of the podcast so people can take a look at them along with the Canadian vegan activists. Yeah. I think and, it's really good. Well, and then uh, uh, another Canadian, Aaron Janice, made uh, Dairy is Scary on YouTube. I heard of that it's, one. It's a five minute uh, clip on the dairy industry, and it kind of holds no. Oh, it doesn't hold back. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually did watch Dominion, and uh, I went all the way through it, and yeah, it's a very eye-opening, uh, you know, I saw that when I watched C uh, Hope, mm -hmm. uh, H-O-P with the periods, Cowspiracy, I mean, yeah, they're, they're really great, and Earthling Eds, that, that shows a lot about how they use animals in, in, uh, in studies, you know, in experiments and stuff like that, so those are great, those are great call-outs. Michael, what have you, or what would you tell your family, friends, and coworkers about being an animal lover and about veganism? Well, I think when I first went vegan, I projected a lot onto my family. I think I might have traumatized myself a little bit too much. <laughs> and uh, I was pr good. pretty angry. Uh, there has been some good conversations, but I'm not sure what I can tell them. 
to like I, I can't make them change and I can't make them like see or why well, I, I can thank them for maybe they haven't understood but my my immediate family I asked them if we could have just plant-based functions uh, which they agreed to and uh, I thank them so much for being able to do that because it was pretty hard for me to be at a table uh, with these products when I was doing certain forms of activism. I do think it's hard with family and friends. I get choked up and sometimes I can't talk or I don't know how to express uh, animal rights or speciesism or whatever it may be because I just, I don't know how to go about it with my friends. And I do still think I have some like healing to do with what I've experienced in order to connect. And I'm trying to be able to connect to, to them again. To my extended family, like, I don't know. I, I really don't know what to say to people. And my coworkers, a lot of them have just debated me just to debate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're actually listening to each other. Mm -hmm. We're just responding to each other. And even as far as like, they would always joke or make fun of me or uh, some have even questioned my sexuality when I first went vegan, which I don't know what ha that has anything to do with <laughs> veganism yeah. or why that even matters. Uh, so I don't really know what to say to people, but perhaps if you've made it this far in listening, like, open your hearts, open your minds and start watching some of these things and, and making changes and just keep an open mind. Uh, but you have to get there yourself. There's nothing that I'm going to say or you're going to say that's going to change them uh, if they're not willing to um, go into themselves and make those changes. Yeah, and, and you're right. That's what it is. It's all about self-reflection and looking deep inside our soul mm -hmm. and um, getting connected with what's really going on. So... I mean, I've had the same type of challenges, uh, not with my wife and daughter, because fortunately, like I said, we're uh, plant-based uh, vegan, let's say, but definitely with other members of my family and friends. I mean, you can't even really have that conversation. I notice that people don't want to have that conversation at all. They just don't want to, again, connect. And I would suggest that if we're at functions and the rest of your family is <laughs> not eating a plant-based meal, it, it might not be even the time to have that discussion. I think people would be more open to hearing about this mm -hmm. if you said, hey, let's go out to Nooch or let's go out to Copper mm -hmm. Branch or come over to my house and I'll make you a plant-based meal and you serve them something, then maybe, like I'm not saying you have to even do it at a dinner function either, but like mm -hmm. it could be a better time to talk about it because when they're eating something in front of you and you're going at it, well, their defense is already up. They're going to say, hey, I don't want to hear about this that it's bad that I'm yeah. doing this when I'm, you know, because of tradition or whatever else they're just using as a justification. Yeah, no, no, uh, no I agree they're, with they're you. They're not open to that, right? No, I agree with you 100%. You're not going to do it when they're actually eating something like that, absolutely. But even at other times, I just personally find it very difficult to get into yeah, a conversation. Yeah, most people don't want to hear it. Yeah, most yeah. people don't want to hear it. So I think it's important that people that are on kind of the same page, uh, you know, they kind of nourish uh, their, their emotions and their feelings uh, and actually... Um, you know, there's so many people out there that just don't know about it. Yeah. Like I said, there's people that, you know, that, uh, you know, we don't know that don't understand this. And I I, think I've those found are the that people. some people don't even want to understand why I am. Like right. they just, they don't want to get into it at all because I don't know if that's like touching on something inside mm -hmm. themselves Could maybe. Be. Like, I, or, yeah. or, you know, like a lot of times what we project on others is stuff that like it's all internal, right? So yeah. uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really know. Well, I mean, here's one guy that wanted to know what's going on for you, you know, and, uh, and you really helped me out a lot to get connected with, with uh, a lot more of my uh, feelings and understanding about things. Last question. What would you tell the viewers watching this? It's probably similar to the, the answer you just gave, but hey, let's, let's look at the viewers that are watching. So what would you tell them about how to greatly reduce their animal products, become plant-forward, plant-based, or ideally vegan? Well, uh, hi viewers, thanks for making it this far, if you've come this far. Um, there's tons of resources on social media. Um, start following activists, doctors, nutritionists. Uh, send me a message, I'll point you in the right direction. There's documentaries. Um, if you're in Windsor, there's a vegan potluck once a month. You don't have to be vegan, come on out. We'll be happy to have you there. That's great advice. You've, you've, you've been amazing. Michael, you've been amazing. I want to thank you today for taking the time from your Sunday to come out here and share your experience, share your feelings, share your knowledge. Uh, it's just, I'm so impressed and I'm so happy that you took the time to do that. And I really, I really believe 
that this will be a very beneficial podcast for people. And I believe that it's going to plant a seed in their mind uh, to really look at animal welfare in a different light and to strongly consider uh, going plant forward and ideally going vegan. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for having me on. Appreciate it. Good job. Thank you, viewers, for uh, taking the time to watch our Planting a Seed podcast today uh, with our guest, Michael McDowell. I, was, I just thoroughly enjoyed this conversation that I had with Michael, and I hope you did too. Hopefully that this conversation will allow you to consider uh, becoming plant forward and hopefully becoming vegan, uh, because I think that's really the only answer to end uh, you know, uh, suffering in the world, because uh, it's important for all suffering then, not just human suffering, but also animal suffering. And you know, the good thing about it is that we uh, are always going to be healthier that way, and we're also going to protect our planet so we can live here for a long time. So thank you very much, and tune in for the next uh, podcast. Bye now.